How would you feel if you could be given the investment strategy proven to build generational wealth so your legacy lasts well beyond your time here in this world? Well, my friends, we have got you covered. Today, we're going to unpack what Morgan Housel, author of The Psychology of Money, has proven to be the most important factors to build generational wealth that lasts. And it does not require taking home run swings. Uh, at investments that promise 20% returns with questionable safety of capital. In this episode, we're going to unpack a Canadian wealth secret that is the most important factor when creating your wealth plan, the biggest risk to the success of your Canadian wealth building journey, and how you can get started implementing this investment strategy that will ultimately lead you to the investment portfolio that will grant you not only financial security you're seeking, but also the time freedom that comes along with it. All right, my friends, this is the Canadian Wealth Secrets Podcast, and you've got Kyle Pierce and John Orr, and uh, here we're going to be helping high net income individuals as well as high net worth individuals to grow their wealth into a legacy that lasts generations through hidden investment and tax secrets your financial advisors won't believe are true. All right, Kyle. To kick off uh, this uh, this episode, you know, there's lots there's lots of things floating around, and I think wonders, you know, floating mm -hmm. around. Especially, you know, that intro that we just you know read out about, like what is the most important factor when mm -hmm. creating our wealth plan? You know, the the risks involved. We're going to unpack those things in this episode, but I think people are are wondering, like I. I, I've been doing this. Is Am I doing the right thing? Is there another best thing? And I think that is an important uh, topic we do have to address here because I think most people can consistently wonder, am I doing enough? And I, mm -hmm. am I doing the right thing? Is there a better strategy that we can do? And I think we're, we're going to answer that here. And it's probably a surprising answer uh, that, uh, that people are kind of like, I want the best strategy. Tell me the best strategy. And they're like, don't worry, we're going to tell you the best strategy. But you're like, wait a minute. I, are you sure that's the best strategy? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think we've all been there before. I know, John, you and I have been there. Matt, you know, our, our other business partner has has been there before where, you know, you get stuck in this like kind of flip flop, like one side of you wants to just make sure everything's going to be OK. Right. Like you're just mm -hmm. like in the future. Am I going to get to that place? We've talked on previous episodes. So if you haven't heard, you need to go all the way back and look at some of the episodes where we talk about actually deciding on what that financial future is. Like, what is it that you want for yourself? That's going to be really important in order to kind of satisfy this wonder that you have. Um, so one side, you want to make sure it's all okay, but you don't know what okay is. Right. And then on the other hand, you've got this like competitive nature, right? Human nature wants to like get more and more and more. Part of it's a bit of like a survival tactic, right? Like you want to like gather and make sure you have enough. Some of us, it's more than others. I'm that guy that I tend to want to make sure I've got more than enough because I don't want to have any possible worry with any of the uncertainty in the future. However, the problem I think that we find ourselves in is that we get ourselves in this place where we start to then get into and like analyzing every single detail and then starting to sometimes lead to inaction because we're mm. trying to figure out what is the best move, like what is right. the right move move. And we've talked about this quite a bit in the past. We like to call it like the home run hit, you know, like you're yeah. looking for the home run and, it, and, and we almost look at it in such a way that like there is only one of those as well. Right. So it's like, I don't want to do this thing because I could maybe do better in that thing. And mm. in reality, really what we're going to unpack here today really stems from the author Morgan Housel's work and uh, you know he's got a great book he has multiple books but he's got a new one called Same as Ever um that one I have not dug into yet however the book that we're going to kind of be pulling apart is just this idea of the psychology of money and uh, the subheader is timeless lessons on wealth greed and happiness so he goes through all of these details but one of the things that I think is most important is the conclusions that he comes to around how to make sure that your investment strategy will lead 
to building generational wealth. And the one thing, as we said in the intro, it is not making sure that you're making an average of 20% per year, because let's be honest, if everyone could do that consistently, we would all do it. One of the challenges becomes is when you start looking at some of those opportunities that are 20%, I'm gonna Mm -hmm. argue that either it's because you've worked really, really, really hard to dig down that rabbit hole to understand that particular asset class. And you're probably still working really hard to ensure that you keep that margin there so that you can make the 20%. So I'm just going to take a step back. Like, think about that for a second. Mm -hmm. If that is what I'm after for investing, what I'm, what you're actually saying is what you're looking for is another full-time job. I was just about to say that it's like you're, 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 you would have to invest all your time if you want to, and then all of a sudden it's like if you want to go into stocks you know and do that you're like well might as well become a stock broker you know or a stock professional stock trader or a, um, that's my day job because that's going to guarantee or or not guarantee and be but better I mean, like, than everyone else job right because exactly. remember what we said the statistics are not pretty for consistently beating the market so that's the what, question becomes is like do you really is it worth it when you right. put in your actual time the hours and yeah. the cost of that and and it's not the it's not who you are as a listener right like you are either a, you know an entrepreneur a business owner you're running your own business you're thinking about other things you don't have you know you don't have that luxury you're like you know you might be like us you don't have that luxury to go like i'm got to figure out all the details over here and in and you know get all of that and then go like wait a minute but that strategy over there might give me a, you know do better i better go learn all about that like there's that's that's the that's really what some mindset is for us, for a lot of us that we are constantly wondering is there a better way because we don't we're not fully invested into mm-hmm. 100% of our time on one particular asset class so you have that constant question like i'm in real estate but should i be over there should i be doing mm-hmm. indexing you know should i be doing you know stock hacking i should you know should i be doing that there's that constant wonder and really that constant wonder of you exploring these avenues actually i think you know, takes away from where the real gains can be made. I love it. And, you know, when we actually look at this and, you know, we're going to let, let a little bit of the, you know, the, the cat out of the bag here and really argue that, you know, alongside Morgan Housel, he says, basically what you want to be seeking in order to have the best chance of reaching that generational wealth goal is seeking averageness. And I love that word averageness because Really what he's saying is that if you're, you know, putting tons of time and effort into trying to take these, you know, these large swings and swing for the fences, the problem is, is that what ends up happening in those scenarios in a lot of cases, we're not saying all, I'm sure there's some people out there that can consistently do really great things and they love putting the time and the effort and, you know, just the, maybe, maybe it doesn't stress them in order to try to get those upsized returns. The reality is, is oftentimes when those types of returns are available to you, there are added risks and added potential for losses um, in other ways, right? And and if you're, let's say, doing 20% here, but let's say you lose half your investment over there, you know, the average between those two things isn't so hot. So I wonder if we could get closer to just what we would call like a typical average And, and here I think is the caveat, is looking for, striving for the averageness, be it if it's 7%, if it's 6%, like whatever that number is for you. Maybe it's it's the index average, right, in the S&P. Whatever you choose, you need to be confident with that. And I would argue that becomes your foundation. That becomes your Mm -hmm. like sort of this, this goal that you've set for yourself. And it doesn't mean to ignore all other opportunities, but it's like do that. And when a potential home run opportunity does arise, maybe you're curious and maybe you like lifting those stones and finding those opportunities. When they arise, you're able to take them, but you've got this wonderful, you know, we'll call it foundation of average backing you up. And what I mean by that is you're not taking all your eggs in one basket 
and throwing them over here into this upsided, you know, this really high average return scenario, what you're doing is you've got this nice foundation so that when it feels right and you feel confident that you can take a portion of that nest egg and you take it and you put it into this opportunity because it feels right. Not a too good to be true, right? But it feels right because you vetted it uh, you feel confident in it and you're okay with the downside risk, then you're able to maybe bump that average up a bit. It's not going to send it your whole portfolio to 20% because if you did that, you've risked all of your portfolio. Here, you're taking smaller sized bets to see if we can get that average up a little bit. But for others, you might choose, you know what? Let's just go with average and let's just ensure that that happens because if I keep that average over time, I could then ensure that I'm going to have a relatively stable uh, wealth or, or portfolio I should ar articulate so that my wealth building journey is easier to accomplish and there's something there for me to pass on to the next generation. Yeah. And I, and I think it's a mindset, you know, and it's a mindset thing because I think, like I said before, it's like, you want to jump around because you're unsure, but you know, you know, Morgan Housel goes to argue that the long-term winners is the average and in mm -hmm. staying with that average is our long-term winner instead of, you know, shooting for the stars, every, every different strategy. So, so when you think about that mindset in, in going, I have to be okay with, you know, majority of what I'm doing as the average. Mm -hmm. And then maybe like you said, small pieces are for when you want to venture into something else or, you know, when you want to try a different strategy, it's not everything. And it's, it often reminds me, it often reminds me of like, it's not to say that the, the percentage here is the same, but I mean like the 20% rule, which is like what Google instituted uh, for their, for their workers is that 20% of your time as an employee here, you can go and do whatever else you want. And, you know, like you can explore, you can, you can, you can learn new things like 20% time. They called it like genius time. This is like something that people would go and like learn new things with. And this is where like Gmail came out of. This yeah. is where like, like Google drive came out of like all of these like unique things came out of their employees being given the creativity freedom to explore new things. But it was like, we're but it wasn't an all or nothing, right? It's, right. It's like saying we're designated this chunk of time. You know, it's a small piece. It's not everything, you know, small piece. So if you think about your portfolio, what's right for you? Like, what do you feel comfortable with as this is your base? And how much over here, like like investors do this all the time. What This part over here is our like our, our play time. But I would think of it more as like your learning time. Think of it like that too, because you need that learning time if you're going to keep your base going mm -hmm. and then go over here. If I do want to explore stock, you know, you know, option trading, well, set, set some goals for yourself on saying like that chunk of time that I want to dedicate is to learn, but then also experiment. And it's like, I'm okay with that over here. This is where my, my long-term average strategy is guaranteeing what I really want. And which is again, the mindset of like, what do we really want is, you know, as our goal for the future. Cause you can extrapolate, you know, you can, you can plan for the future to go like, this is enough. This is enough for the life I want to live. And this is enough for my family. And if I keep doing this, this is enough to pass on that generational wealth. So mm. let's stick with that. And then let's also, when things come up, we can then dedicate time and some resources to exploring that, but make sure you decide, like, this is why it's a mindset thing, decide what you want. And we've talked about this before, like Matt on, on previous episodes talked about his personal beliefs, you know, like what is that belief? We have to all decide what is enough and what do we want to look, shoot for so that we can be, be confident that, that we'll, we'll get there and we've got a plan to get there. Mm, I love that. You know, and really, you know, you, you said a couple things that I want to reiterate. You had mentioned about, you know, if from a time perspective, but I would argue that like similar ratio should be happening with your portfolio size as well. Right. So, John, right. you're talking about, you know, spending a certain amount of time to, let's say, learn about an asset class. So maybe you're spending 20 percent of your time 
uh, doing that. Now, for some people, you might be like, I don't have 20% of all my time to learn about that, but maybe 20% of your investment time, right? Like the time you spend thinking and reflecting on your portfolio. But the same should probably be true for that amount of your portfolio. We said 20%. We're not suggesting that has to be the number. It no, might that be 5%. Was just an example. Yeah, yeah example. absolutely. Absolutely. But th- those two things are really important because time is an investment as well. It's not just the money in your portfolio. It's not just, you know, how much uh, your, your net worth is. It's also the time because I would argue that most of us are building our wealth so that we have more time freedom. We have more control over our time. We have that security, that financial security and stability so that we can make choices that maybe we may not have been able to make uh, without the same uh, you know, financial ramifications earlier in life, right? So when you're mm-hmm. just starting and you're just getting in, you know, into the world of work, you know, when you make a choice to take time off and go on a vacation, maybe spend money and you're not earning income, that's a much bigger sacrifice when you're younger than it is when you're older. Now, some would argue me on that and say, no, when you're younger is when you're supposed to do that. It, it's all mindset and it's all what is your goal? What's your personal beliefs that you're after? So one other piece that I think is really important for us to consider here is this idea of what is, and we'll use the 80-20 idea here, John, like you said, mm-hmm. it doesn't have to be 20% that mm-hmm. we're dealing with. It could be 10 and 90, it could be five and 95. It's, it's totally up to you, you have to decide that. But if let's say we use 80-20 as the example, the biggest question I think you need to ask yourself is what is your 80%? Mm-hmm. What is that asset class? What is that you know, sort of you know, thing, that approach that you're going to use that is going to represent 80% of that wealth building journey or 90% or 95, whatever that number is for you. And I would argue that when we hear from folks who listen to the podcast, one thing that we've recognized, it's a pattern we're seeing with many of the calls that we're having and, and don't, I'm, I'm not blaming anybody because I've been there, I've totally been there, is that we spend 80% or 90 or 95% of our time on the next thing instead Mm. of the opposite. So we're actually doing the opposite. And the real question I think we need to ask ourselves first is which asset class am I most confident in now that can ensure that I'm invested now? So for some of you, that might be just a mutual fund at the bank. And again, we're not going to pick on you if you have a mutual fund. You hear so many people say like mutual funds, you could do it better in an index. If it means taking action, go take action. Book the appointment and make it happen. Get into the market, make it happen so that you're doing something. What is that 80%? What's that big chunk that is going to be your averageness that you're looking for? You have to decide on that before you wanna go down other rabbit holes. So for those who are just starting, let's say a real estate journey, right? I started way back, started looking in 2008 and 2009. I had some mutual funds kind of sitting there doing kind of, you know, it's thing doing kind of nothing, but at least it was something. And I went down the rabbit hole of real estate at that time. I would argue that if that's you and you're exploring that, you need to also be thinking that this is going to be a journey for you. And you don't want to look back five, six, seven, ten 10 years from now and recognize that, oh my gosh, I didn't have something working towards my average mm-hmm. that I really wanted or needed to help me along this wealth building journey. So it's it's almost like an action here that I, re- I, I feel folks should have is by taking some sort of action on the thing that you know best. And it doesn't mean that it has to be the thing that's going to earn you most. And I Mm -hmm. think this is the part that people get stuck in. It's like they want to go for that home run, so they want to do better than maybe what they're doing now, or maybe they're hesitant to get themselves invested into something because they're worried that it's not going to have a big enough return. Well, if we don't take that action, that would, I would argue, is your biggest risk because your average return on nothing is 0%. Right. So if I'm not doing something, then my average, I'm starting with a really low average. And the longer I go with that Mm -hmm. average at zero, the worse it becomes. Right. Because Mm -hmm. then we get in a scenario where we get someone reaching out to us who wants to retire in five years and they say, 
I want to do it with real estate, but they're still in the learning journey of real estate. It's like, okay, well, what are we going to do in the meantime while we work our way towards that goal? And is real estate even the best fit for you? Uh, Because what it sounds like to me when I hear someone who's five years away from retirement and they don't have, say, you know, the real estate portfolio started yet is that they're hoping for some home runs. Right. And if we're hoping for home runs, we're setting ourselves up for a really, really uncertain situation. So it's like, what are, what is that foundation going to look like for you? And then we can branch right. off and see how do we raise that averageness that we're mm-hmm. after from day one. Yeah. I think for me, the secret is, is thinking of it in terms of intensity versus consistency. You know, I think mm. what you're saying is like people are trying to swing for home runs at the end or, or figuring out like, oh, I want to retire now. It's only five years. I want to go early. But now I'm now I'm forced into moments of intensity where I have to swing for the fences or I have to do something big, you know, whereas the secret right is focusing on the consistency. What can we do consistently? Because it's like, you know, that if you want to get in shape, right, like you're not going to go and hit the gym two days in a row and 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 bulk up and try to try to like lift as much weight. So you're going to all of a sudden be jacked, you know, like Mm -hmm. it's not, that's not how, you know, getting in shape works. Getting in shape works is, is saying like every day I'm going to go and I'm going to spend 25 minutes or 30 minutes. And you know, in two years I'm going to be jacked. You know, Mm -hmm. it's, 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 that's a moment of, of, uh, or moments of consistency that create results, not intensity doesn't always create the results in certain situations and, and building your portfolio journey. Most of us know that it is an, you know, acts of regular consistency that will create those results. But to pair that with what you're saying is we've got to choose, you know, where that averageness is. And then we focus on the consistency there so that we can create, you know, that personal belief that you're after. I love it. And, you know, I want to speak specifically to our entrepreneurs and our business owners out there, Uh, you know, and and this may also just be more like of our high income or high net income individuals out there who do have a significant amount of, of money that they're sitting and they're looking and going like, what do I do with this stuff? So like one, one action is of course, picking that thing for consistency, right? For averageness. But I would go a step further and say, those who have corporate structures, for example, you know, John, you and I and, and Matt, we have corporate structure, you know, some of the biggest uh, and most important decisions that we make that have will have a biggest that have the biggest impact on our future wealth building uh, and that that legacy that we're looking to create really comes down to the decisions we make and where we make the investments inside of what structure right? So for some of you, that might be if you don't have a a corporate structure, it's like, am I investing in my RRSP? Am I investing in my tax-free savings account? Which one should do which? And ensuring that you have an understanding around the structures that are available to you is really important. And uh, the reason why I say entrepreneurs and business owners is because the vast majority that we've chatted with, and we work with a lot of entrepreneurs and business owners, the vast majority, they have a financial advisor, they have an account, and these are all good people. Like we're not picking on these people. But the reality is, is that by making small adjustments, not to the investment itself and what they want to invest in, but small adjustments in where they're making the investment, inside a corporation, inside a holding corp, or whatever structures or strategies we put in place, that do not involve the risk associated with the actual investment, oftentimes what happens is they actually open themselves up to having more access to capital instead of having to make a higher risk play. So in summary, it's actually easier if we structure things better so that we you know, consider all the tax implications and we use creative strategies in order to do so in a compliant way so that I could actually aim for a lower averageness than maybe I had in mind originally and still be ahead of where I would have been had I added in a few of those home run swings in there. So imagine that world. Like imagine if it was less about the investment you're actually making and more about where the money is in terms of where that investment is happening. 
and the process in which the investment is being essentially purchased or invested. That to me is one of the biggest game changers that anyone can make out there. So let alone deciding to invest is one thing, but then also having a clear understanding. So, you know, for example, just to give one quick example for those who are, you know, kind of leaning in on this and going like, what do you really mean here? I'm gonna talk about someone, not worry about a corporation or business owner, just talk to the everyday individual who's putting money into an RRSP. If I'm putting money into an RRSP, I save tax now, beautiful, but I gotta pay tax later. Imagine a world where I put a bunch of money into this account that's tax sheltered from now until whenever I take money out, except the only difference is, is that when I put the money in there, even on capital gains, which normally is only taxed 50% of that, that gain is taxed, meaning your tax rate is cut in half, you actually don't get that advantage coming out of an RRSP, right? So I'm not saying RRSPs are bad for everyone, or certain scenarios, but it's something that people need to understand is that, hmm, there may be times where an RSP might be a bad fit for some individuals, and there may be time where it's a perfect fit for some individuals. But imagine a world where you could buy the same investment, put it in one thing versus another, and come out in a very different place. To me, that's probably even more important than the actual investment you're making, be it in mutual funds, be it in an index fund, or be it in, say, something like real estate, private lending, any of these other asset classes. So we're going to end here. I think the big takeaway, John, I loved how you put that intensity versus consistency. Are you being intense or are you being consistent? right? And I think you want to be aiming for consistency, okay? So if you're feeling like you're working hard, trying to like make this thing work, and you're going for the fence every single time, mm -hmm. let's, let's be cautious about that. I think that's a big, big takeaway. And I would argue a next step that I would, I would really encourage people to take is actually starting to think more, less about the investment itself, and more about where, where is the investment happening, and is it suitable for me? If you're interested in us having a look, giving you a second opinion, getting you some ideas, we always wanna make sure that in every call we get or we, get, we hop on that we give you at least one takeaway that you can take with you, be it back to your accountant, back to your uh, advisor, back to your lawyer, whatever it might be, at least one big takeaway so that you are in a better place after the call than you were before the call. And so far, John, I'm happy to say it, we've had a 100% success rate because we ask at the end of every call what their big takeaway is. So if that's you, hop on with us, head on over to Canadian Wealth Secrets dot com forward slash discovery that's canadian wealth secrets dot com forward slash discovery and we'd be happy to have a quick review and chat with you to ensure that you've got all your ducks in the row that you're after Folks, we want to thank you for listening in on this episode of the Canadian Wealth Secrets podcast. Uh, when we talked to, at the beginning of the episode, we were hoping to give you those big takeaways and, and those big takeaways that you wanted to be walking away with, which was, you know, unpacking the secret to that most important factor. We hope we have kind of conveyed that secret to you. We talked about big the big risk that's kind of holding many people back and how do you overcome that risk? And then also, how do you get started in thinking about about um, that strategy and, and specifically how do we how do we be more consistent there so thanks again folks for listening in on on this episode and um, we would encourage you to share this episode with someone you would think uh, would get benefit from it um, and uh, you can also you know share the link to us on YouTube Twitter Instagram Facebook all of those things just go and search for Canadian wealth secrets in those platforms share it away to the person that you think would benefit the most from listening to this episode. All right. Once again, the website is CanadianWealthSecrets.com and you can find all the episodes on the website over at CanadianWealthSecret.com forward slash episode 58. That's CanadianWealthSecrets.com forward slash episode 58. 
58. And my friends, we are so happy to say that class is dismissed. Just as a reminder, folks, uh, the information you heard here today is for informational purposes only. You should not construe any such information or other material as legal, tax, investment, financial, or other advice. John Orr is a mortgage agent with Bricks Mortgage License M2300-6803. And Kyle Pierce is a licensed life and accident and sickness insurance agent and wealth architect with the PanCorp team, which includes corporate advisors and Pan Financial.